Homo sapiens, the human race, males and females, men and women, are animals. Modern humans seem to have a little bit of problem with that. They give lip service to the idea, but I think most of them are confused and afraid of the concept. I'm Stephen Arms, and welcome to... The Human Sexes, a Xenobiologist's Tale. A xenobiologist is a scientist, a biologist that studies life on other planets. In 2018 Common Era, or Current Era, CE, uh, Earth has no xenobiologists because there's been no life discovered on other planets. But our, our xenobiologist is from, is from the planet Kuzbe. His name is Zoltar, and he's uh, coming to look at the Earth at about 27,000 years ago, which would be 25,000 BCE, before Common Era. So he pilots his little vessel into this nice little solar system that has a type G yellow star, which are generally good they found for having life around them. And his race has studied the life on this planet in the past. Um, they had great expectations several hundred million years ago about a species that in um, modern times would be called, again, all of this is going to be in modern colloquial English because I doubt anyone here speaks, speaks Kuzbanian, called dinosaurs. And they had great expectations, but then one catastrophic event, one rogue comet, and well, so much for the dinosaurs. But life did continue on the planet with the development of other species. So, we're, so as he pulls into this solar system, it's an easy solar system to find. It has a couple of large, beautiful planets, a large gas giant that has stripes all over it and a big red storm in it, and a beautiful ringed, bluish world. But those planets are too far out from the from the, from Sol, from this Chaik G sun, to be able to um, have life on it. It's the inner worlds, the second, the third, or the fourth world, that would be in the zone that might be able to generate life. Now the second planet is a greenish planet. It looks like it has potential, but the surface temperature is around 800 degrees. It's way too hot. It's way too hot for life. The uh, fourth world is a little red world. It has um, some water, and a, but a very thin atmosphere, and it's been generally too cold for life. So one planet is too hot and one planet is too cold, but the third planet is just right. And the third planet is a um, world that they're going to, we're going to call Earth. It has a nice atmosphere that shields the uh, planet from most of the harmful rays from the sun. Uh, it has a uh, large satellite around it, which helps facilitate the development of life. And the surface is mostly water. Now again, it did very well with the dinosaurs, so let's, but other species have been going on. The oceans teem with fish and uh, mollusks and other forms of life. The surface has reptiles, amphibians, avians, insects, lots of insects. But the species, the most developed species are mammals. Now again, for those who are unfamiliar with the concept of mammal, a mammal is a warm-blooded animal that gives live birth and its young suckle milk to survive. Now, there are many mammals on this planet. It's coming on the end of a cold spell itself, an ice age, and there are large woolly elephant creatures, we'll call mammoths, and large woolly rhinoceroses, we'll call woolly rhinoceroses, and a lot of big aggressive species, um, four or five hundred pound dire wolves and their smaller cousins, gray wolves, are on the world at the time, and then uh, about four or five hundred pound saber-toothed cats. So it's plenty of dangerous things on it. But amongst the mammals, it isn't the it isn't these huge rhinos or these huge elephants that the, the Kuzbanian um, xenobiologist is looking at. He's looking at a medium-sized primate, an anthropoid, in essence an ape. It's a hairy ape, that has, but it has short hair except in a few parts of its body that are a little bit longer. But what makes it unique is its tool using. For about uh, 700,000 years at this point, it has had fire. And for at least about 50 to 100,000 years, it has domesticated or formed a partnership with wolves to the point that they've actually become, we'll call them dogs now. 
and this species is called the human race. So 27,000 years ago, puts it at 25,000 BCE, which is uh, smack in the middle of what's called the Paleolithic period, or the Old Stone Age. Uh, human beings at this point are nomadic hunter-gatherers. They travel in tribal units of about 50 or so. They uh, wear animal skins. They build shelters out of um, tents out of animal skins also, or simple huts. And when they can find them, they live in caves. Now, they have developed various technology, which I mentioned before, you know, fire and the domestication of the dog being significant. But also they have a lot, they develop stone implements, uh, mostly um, making use of the machine of the lever, which of course is for moving things, and also a lever is simply a club. And the other is the wedge, which is used for tools, but also used for the construction of weapons. Stone axes, spearheads, and to the more advanced uh, humans, arrowheads for bows and arrows. Those aren't quite as advanced use uh, spear throwing devices called atlatls. They're simply a throwing stick that is held in the hand and it adds another joint onto the arm and allows you to throw the spear more efficiently. With arrows and with um, hunting dogs and with working together as units, they're able to take down even the large mammals of uh, this uh, Paleolithic world. Now again, the society is organized as tribes there are basically clans of humans living together, mostly under the leadership of elders. They, have, uh, they don't have a written language at this point, so they're surviving on oral traditions. They have real no, no, really no concept of property as in land, since they're a moving people. And they do have some art. They, they do simple carvings, and they do, uh, in caves, they do cave paintings and uh, carved horn and bone. But they basically function as hunter and gatherers. Now, the genders themselves function in this um, in this aspect. The males are primarily the hunters. They are, since there's a testosterone, testosterone in them makes them larger. They tend to be stronger, have denser bones. They um, are much more aggressive because of this. Also, they also live about a tenth less the lifespan of the female because of this. Also, they um, they hunt well with the dogs. And they have good um, distance vision, binocular vision, and then their strength and their size helps them in hunting. They also, of course, are responsible for protecting the uh, tribe from threats because they are, again, larger, more aggressive. And since the gestation period on humans is basically about 10 lunar cycles, or what would be in uh, modern times called nine months, they are... Um, the females in the last part of that of their pregnancies are very vulnerable. It's difficult for them to move quickly, and the males are responsible for um, having to protect them. The females in the human tribe function mostly as gatherers. They are, they are smaller than the males, and they have good nurturing and actually social organization skills. Um, since human offspring are very attritional, meaning, meaning they have a long period before they're able to function in the wild on their own. They, they spend their time almost exclusively with the female for the period of several years. The, for the first 10 or so lunar cycles, the female must feed the, uh, off, her offspring, the babies as we will call them, her milk, or the baby will not survive. If she doesn't nurse the child, the child will not survive. And specifically when they're first born, female, human females produce something called colostrum. It's a very uh, rich and rich in hormones and various vitamins that are needed for the early development of a human, of a human infant. And that milk is, is essential for them to be able to thrive. So they are tied to them. Nature doesn't play favorites. So the female has to take care of her young for a considerable amount of time. And they, um, they will not, it will not be able to function on its own for, until for at least five to ten years of time before they'll be actually becoming a functional member of the tribe. Um, the females have advantages, though, because of this. They, um, they see color better than the males do, which helps in the, in the hunting and gatherer aspects, the gathering aspects of it. 
Uh, they have good low range hearing and good peripheral vision, both of which are handy for keeping track of offspring and other survival traits. They take temperature extremes, both heat and cold, better than the males do. And all in all, and they live longer. So they have, they have many advantages that nature has put into them to allow them to help the tribe to survive. When looking at the human beings, they both need each other to survive. Uh, they're, they're physically similar, but also different, but they are very much um, essential to each other. Both, though they're physically diff slightly different, they're also, because of the differences in nature, their, their psychologies, their minds are also different. Uh, one of the Kuzbanian anthropologists tells a story that when a human male originally found fire, lightning had struck a tree and he picked up a burning branch and ran back to the tribe with it, and he was waving around and poking it in people's, at people and scaring everybody with his burning stick until one of the females finally came up, took it away from him, and told him to stop that. He was going to put somebody's eye out. And then she told him to go get some sticks. I bet you if I give it sticks and feed it, we can keep it around. It'll give light and heat. Now, it's a good story. If it isn't true, it probably should be. But it does reflect the differences in the mindsets of the males and the females. The males are very aggressive. They, uh, they function together as hunting units. They, uh, they are, in a lot of ways, they're very, uh, they're dominant, and they can be much more disagreeable. They have to be um, conscientious. They have to be willing to work together, but it's working together in, in the hunting unit. Very distinct jobs. If you don't plant your spear and stop the, and stop the antelope, we're not going to eat that day. And because of that, they also have a tendency of being more volatile and, and because they're aggressive. They tend to think linearly in straight lines. Now, whereas the females are much more likely to think more circularly, they are, um, they are very responsive and very um, sympathetic and very compassionate, because they have to be. A child isn't wrong. It has to be taken care of. If it cries, if it has a problem, it's a difficulty, if the female is not aware of it, then the tribe doesn't survive because the child doesn't survive. They have, they have a great degree of conscientiousness also because they work together well. And, but the females work together in different ways. The males work more like hunting packs or teams where the females tend to work more in a societal method. Again, they don't deal with it linearly. They look at problems as a gatherer. A gatherer is a circle looking around as compared to a male, a hunter, which is, which is much more linear. And therefore, you know, Males will be more volatile. Females will tend to be more, will tend to be more withdrawn, because conflict within the tribe, the problem, it will cause the tribe not to be able to survive. It's time to end our uh, Kuzbanian xenobiological tale, and say goodbye to Zoltar, and uh, we'll surmise this dealing with just Professor Arms again. The point of my video though it seems probably obvious to some people, is that the sexes are different. We're equal, which is what I kept pointing to, trying to point out, but we are different. And if we're equal, true equality means that both men and women need to be treated fairly. Now, are we dominated entirely by our um, gender roles as part of our biology? Of course not. We're also intelligent animals. For example, myself, my wife and I have been married for uh, 34 years. Uh, we've been together for about two years before that and have had a wonderful life together. We've, wa we've raised two very intelligent, healthy children, and I'm happy. But I had to learn how to nurture because we both had to work during our lives. So, And it was difficult for me to learn that. It doesn't come naturally to me because, you know, I'm a guy. Males don't always think in that sort of way. And you're saying, oh, well, you're just being, you know, an, you know, I'm just being a primitive or whatever. And I go, no, i just a man who understands that there are biological differences between us and some things come easier to males and some things come more difficult to males and vice versa. I mean, we are not required to function in just our gender roles. But on the other hand, we shouldn't ignore them either. Um, if a woman wishes to take care of children because she's good at it, and she is, you know, 
inclined in many ways to be in that direction. There is nothing dishonorable about a map. It's entirely the opposite. Is there anything more important than raising children for the future of the world? If a man has to do that job, he's going to probably find it more difficult, but I give him full kudos and credit for him his ability to do it. But there are many people in our society who don't want to consider the fact that gender roles are part of a healthy society. And they're trying to basically say that we're all some kind of an, an androgynous creature and they're all exactly the same. And that is both a denial and an insult to the fundamental strengths that each sex has. You know, food for thought on the end here. If you're a misogynist, then that means that you're a male chauvinist. If you're a misandrist, that means you're a female chauvinist. Whatever the case is, you're both being a chauvinist. And in essence, a chauvinist is simply a bigot. And if you want to be a bigot, then go ahead and keep thinking that way. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you've enjoyed the video, please mark like. And if you dislike it, uh, go ahead and mark the dislike. And please leave me comments to tell me what I can do better. And of course, if you want to keep me making videos, please subscribe. Thank you very much.